want to start by saying that I am an accidental entrepreneur. Um, I'm going to give you a really quick timeline. I went to UC Berkeley as an undergrad. I studied environmental science. I then went on to my parents' great pleasure to be a river rafting guide. Um, as part of that, I, I found this obscure sport called extreme whitewater paddling. I did that for five years. Then I went to law school. I became a complex commercial litigator at a big international law firm. I did that for seven and a half years. Um, and somewhere in there, Kelly and I discovered CrossFit um, and decided to randomly open a CrossFit. Some of you who have heard of San Francisco CrossFit, it was outside. Um, and I just want to say for the record, for everyone who's opened an outdoor gym in COVID and put it into a container, that's super 2005. We did that before. Um, we were the ones who started the outdoor gym thing. Um, we did that for a lot of years. We actually closed our gym a couple years ago. But um, I'll talk a little bit more about how I'm an accidental, accidental entrepreneur. But when I start, what I want to start by saying is, if anyone wants to be an entrepreneur, you don't need to set out to be an entrepreneur. You can do a lot of different things. And if you have a cool idea, um, again, like these guys said, there's nothing special. You don't need to be smart. You don't need to have a certain kind of education. It's a learning curve. We learned on the job. Um, but what I want to talk about today is what I think are the five key life lessons and skills I think you need to have if you want to pursue anything in entrepreneurship and what I think has served me well. OK, so I think this lesson, um, cultivating self-awareness, is maybe the most important thing for anyone who is going into anything entrepreneurial. And actually, I think it's really just useful in life. I think it's useful in relationships. Um, I, and I, I want to tell you a little bit about the first force lesson on me in cultivating self-awareness. So in my middle school, for some reason, um, the cool thing to do was to be in choir, which is super 1980s. Um, and in seventh grade, I, and it was very selective. In seventh grade, I was selected into the choir, which probably had 50 girls. It was called Emerald. We were like the cool kids on campus. We were in Emerald, the choir. Um, and I just assumed that because I had been selected for Emerald, the choir, I was a good singer. And that the next year, I would make the selective choir called Sapphire, um, which only had 15 girls. Um, and when I didn't make the choir, that was my first life lesson of like, oh, I'm actually not a good singer. And singing is not something I should pursue. Um, so lesson learned. Um, I, I think many of you have probably had lessons like this in your life, probably a 1,000 of them. Um, but one of the questions we often get asked is, as most of you know, um, I'm in this business in partner with my husband, Kelly Sarat. In fact, you guys all probably know him and don't know me. Um, and people often ask us, how do the two of you actually manage to be spouses and raise kids? and work together. And I think the reason we can do it is because we are both super self-aware about what we are good at and what we are not good at. And Kelly and I are not good, we are not good at and not good at different things. Um, let me give you a few examples. How many of you guys have ever seen Kelly like in a video? Have any of you guys seen Kelly in a video? All right, so he's really good at that. He actually makes all those videos in like one take. Um, he, you know, just comes up with all these ideas off the top of his head. I could never do that. I'm super awkward on video. I feel uncomfortable. Were I to make a video, I would need to like plan it out and script it down in advance. And even then I would still be awkward and it would be weird. Um, I can also name a thousand other things that he's good at that I'm not good at and vice versa. But it's, I think, part of the reason why our partnership works and I think critical to running any kind of organization. In fact, I would argue that you can't have a successful organization unless your leaders are self-aware. I think it creates uh, an environment of creativity. I think it allows people who work with you to feel like they can fail. I don't think you can have a growth mindset without self-awareness. Um, and so I think there's lots of ways to cultivate it. I mean, one of them is to have it happen to you like it happened to me in seventh grade where you learn you're not a good singer and decide that's not an avenue you should pursue. Um, I also think you can ask the people around you, like, what do you see? What do you see as my strength or we strength and weaknesses? What, how can I work on it? Um, ask questions. Be curious. Be open-minded. Um, I, I really do think, especially as I look at all the people that I know here at this event who I know are successful, one of their most important qualities is they're self-aware. And this will tie into a bunch of the other things I talk about coming up here. Um, I like this concept. Um, have any of you guys read the book Good to Great by Jim Collins? Um, if you haven't, it's one of my favorite books on leadership and running a business. I actually usually, it's one of the few books I reread every few years. Um, but the concept of being a hedgehog is that the fox, if you kind of think of this image, a fox is the person you know who's always like trying new things. Like right now, they're gonna be like a coach. And then they're like, no, 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 I'm not gonna be a coach, I'm gonna be an influencer. And then they're gonna be over here 
doing these other things, and they're always changing their mind. Um, and that's fine, and our world is open for that. But if you really want to be successful at entrepreneurship, you need to do one thing. You need to stay in your lane. Um, Kelly and I have been doing this thing, which we joke around and call stretching for many years. We've always stayed in our lane. We've teach people how to take care of their bodies. We teach people how to put input into their bodies. And that's what we do. Now, how we do it, some subtext, that's fine. We change around a little bit, but like we do one thing. Like we've stayed in our lane and focused on that thing. And that's why we're masters at it. Um, and I think that's a huge part of being a successful entrepreneur is choosing something you're good at that you're passionate about and doing that one thing. Don't just reverse course when you have failures or challenges. That, that, is, that is not the key. You wanna just be a hedgehog. Okay, this I think is maybe one of the most important things and actually underappreciated. This basically is integrity. Do what you say you're gonna do. Um, you've heard this phrase before, but what I would add is do it when you say you're gonna do it. I've had so many experiences in my life where people do do, people who work for me or people I interact with, partners or whatever, whatever, they do what they say they're going to do, but they do it two weeks after they say they're going to do it. Um, and I think this is so important in terms of eroding credibility and making sure people don't trust you. Um, and I think that that's really everything in business is trust. So don't just do what you say you're going to do, do it when you're going to do it. But there's also a fail safe for this. And the fail safe for this is communication, which is such a huge part of any business. Um, you can fail, there's room to fail. You can even not do what you said you were gonna do when you're gonna do it, but only if you communicate that. So it's fine if you miss a deadline. Most deadlines are fake deadlines. Most of the deadlines we create and the things we do, most of us are in the health and fitness business. None of our deadlines are real. It's not like in the military where anyone could die if a poor decision is made. Most deadlines are fake. But what's bad is to miss a deadline without communicating about it because that ultimately erodes your credibility. The way I see it the most is, is often in the little small things, people often meet their big important deadlines, but I often see that people miss 25 little teeny deadlines and they're not doing what they say they're gonna do 25 times and those little things add up. So this is one of my core values as a person. I try to do what I say I'm gonna do when I say I'm gonna do it. Sometimes I overcommit myself um, and sometimes I'm bummed later when I realize, oh shit, I've gotta stay up until 10 o'clock tonight because I agreed to do this, this at, at my work and then I'm gonna make cookies for my kids' school and I'm gonna volunteer at this thing and I'm working full time. But man, if I said I'm gonna do it, I do it. I never bail, I do it and I do it when I say I'm gonna do it. So I think this is a lesson that I've really struggled to learn, and I think Kelly and I together have, have really struggled with this, and I'll tell you a story about that. Um, but this is really a lesson in delegation, and I will say that in my early entrepreneur years, I really sucked at this um, and struggled to figure out how to do it right. Um, but the question that you really wanna ask yourself in most instances is not, is not um, how do I do something? Like, I need to build an app. How do I build an app? The question you actually want to ask yourself is, who is going to build my app? Um, because chances are there's somewhere, someone out there in the world who is smarter, faster, more efficient. They're an expert at this thing that you think you can do. And I think for those of us who have run businesses and grown businesses, especially when we're really bootstrapping them and don't have a ton of money on hand, is we think, well, I'm just going to do everything myself. But I think in the end, often that leads to burnout and stress and, and in the end, a worse work product um, because you're not having an expert do what an expert is supposed to do. So how many of you guys have read the book Becoming or seen the book Becoming a Supple Leopard? Um, so we got the book contract for that book in late 2010. And we we're so excited. We're like, oh my God, we got a book contract. This is so exciting. Like nobody we know has ever gotten a book contract. This is so cool. And then we, and Kelly has the ideas, the architect, ar archetypes and all the things that are going to be in the book. And it's all like swirling around in his head, like beautiful mind. Um, and I'm like, okay, I'm here tactically. Like I'm on the ground. How are we going to do this? And, and what we realized is we were writing a textbook and I don't know if you guys know what textbooks are like, but there's a lot of photos of them in them. And there's like all these places in the textbook where 
you have to refer, like I talked about this here and you have to refer from here to there. And it's actually really complicated. Like writing a textbook is like a specific skill that expert people are supposed to do. So for a whole year, we would like open our computer and open a Word document and be like, okay, what do you, how do you write a textbook? And we would stare at it. And then I was like, okay, maybe Kelly, you dictate and I'll type what you say. And, and then we're like, okay, maybe we should start with a photo shoot. Like maybe we should just hire a photographer and we'll like take the photos and then like the book will just come into place. We'll just fill in the words. And anyway, obviously none of that worked. We probably wrote like two sentences in an actual Word document. We never took any photos. We sat on the book contract. We were totally panicked because in fact, the book was due. And, and speaking of due dates, like we care about due dates. Well, we totally blew our due date. Um, we called our publisher after a year and said, total failure. We're trying to just sit here, stare at this empty Word document. We cannot write this book, Becoming a Supple Leopard. What should we do? And he's like, hey, you guys need a co-writer. And we were like, oh, oh, okay. So we brought on this guy, Glenn, who has an expertise in writing textbooks. Um, and we met with him for the next year, and he helped us put the whole book together and got all the ideas onto paper, helped us figure out the, the photography and how to refer everything everywhere in a textbook. Um, and that was really such an important lesson for both of us in we didn't get a book contract. And what we, what we did do is we said, how can we write a book? We have this book contract now. Let's ask ourselves how. That was the wrong question. What we should have asked ourselves the moment the book landed in our lap, the book contract landed in our lap is who is going to help us write this book? Because we can write, but we're not writers and we are not experts at writing textbooks. So asking myself this question has been one of the most important lessons I've learned in entrepreneurship is, um, and, and I think it dovetail, dovetails so much with the self-awareness, is there are so many things I'm not good at. I know my business is gonna, if I hire people who are good at the thing that I am not good at and have no idea how to do. For example, Lisa in our audience produces our podcast. I have no idea how to do that. Our podcast would never show up anywhere in the world. Kelly and I would just talk into the ether if we didn't have Lisa to actually produce our podcast. So um, I think in these moments in time when you're really stressing about how you're going to do something, think about how to reframe it and who is going to do this thing. Because even though it may be daunting as an entrepreneur at the beginning because you think, oh, no, I have to outlay money to pay for someone, usually hiring an expert to do something right and someone who actually knows how to do it in the end, will make you more money in the long run. Okay, this is my lesson five. Um, I also think so important. Um, you got to give away a lot of stuff if you're an entrepreneur. Um, I think that there's this mentality, especially now in the days of like VC and private equity, that everyone's like, I'm going to write my business plan and I'm going to go make my deck and then I'm going to go to Silicon Valley and I'm going to get my money and I'm going to like, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur now, like I'm doing it. Um, but let me tell you what Kelly and I did when we started Mobility Wad, which is now the Ready State, is in 2010, some of you may recall with fondness, Kelly made a video of himself squatting in our backyard. Um, and I'm sorry there's kids in the audience, but I mean, basically the entire video was like focused at his package and it was early YouTube and there were a lot of problems with it. The audio was terrible. We just threw that thing up on YouTube, didn't tell anybody. Um, and somehow people found it and started watching it. But that led us to making free content on YouTube for over two years. I think we made something like 450 videos. Um, we didn't actually turn the Ready State into a subscription model where we made money until 2013. So between like late 2009 and 2013, we were just pumping free content out into the world. Um, and then I think everybody thinks now to this day, you know, obviously we've established ourselves, we're credible, people know who we are in the space, we're professionals, we still give a ton of stuff away. Um, Kelly still sees people for free, we still work with organizations for free, we often, you know, take speaking engagements for free, you name it, we're still doing a lot of stuff for free, because we see the value in creating partnerships, stoking out our friends, um, you know, just being available and, and helping our community. Um, so I think everybody thinks you just have to go out there and make money and that every hour of your day has to be paid and that, that you know, if you're not making money, it means you're not credible and you're not successful. And I would totally disagree. I think in order to start a business and develop credibility and get a following and have a brand, you need to give away stuff. 
Um, and you don't need to do it like we did. We maybe dug a bit of a trench by making videos in our garage for three whole years and it was really tiring and our kids were babies and it was overall like not the most fun time. But when, when we look back on it, we realize we spent a ton of time just giving away our content and our knowledge for free, um, throwing it out into the world. And man, that has reaped so many rewards for us as, a, as business owners since then. So those are my five lessons of being an entrepreneur. Thank you guys for listening. Thank <laughs> you.